all the speakers and everybody is welcome to remain because this is this open session. Welcome to this you know, rather informal space that we have opened up for discussion. In, in the past two days, the, the messages that we've been seeing in chat, the questions raised have convinced us that there is so much more that needs to be heard, shared, communicated. And to partly address that, we have actually created this session to let as many as possible to voice their ideas. And I would request uh, anyone who wishes to speak to indicate that by, by using that hand raise option. And, and please keep your intervention to you know, three to five minutes. And with this, I, I hand over to my co-moderator, Grant Schreiber. Grant, if you would like to share your thoughts with us. And after that, we can move to anybody else who would like to interview. Grant? Thanks, Janani. Um, hi, everyone. I haven't introduced myself yet. So I'm Grant Schreiber. I'm the campaign manager for the Human Security for All campaign, which, uh, as you know, is a joint collaboration between World Academy of Arts and Science and the UN Human Security Office. Um, the purpose of this session, this final session, is to wrap up final thoughts and summaries around what stood out for you over the last three days. Um, who knew that human security and education could manifest in so many different ways? We've heard about the role of law. We've heard about the role of um, creating resilient future leaders among the youth. Uh, people have spoken about physical and mental health, how finance, business, and the economy have a role to play in solving social problems, and of course, the role of art and science and technology, um, which is raising our consciousness around human security, and how this is going to affect the quality of life for billions of people in the future. So the question we would like to, to ask is, from all these varied topics the last three days, what key messages have stood out for you? What new insights have you gained? And most importantly, what action would you propose as a next step? The, the visionary statements and the strategies are relatively simple to, to compile, but the implementation and the action is a lot harder, as we all know. So if you could, as Janani mentioned, try and stay to, to three minutes. Um, I think we have another 45 minutes of the session, and we, we'd love to hear from everyone. But um, if we could just start with um, Chris Walmart, who's had his hand up for a while already, and then move across to everyone else. Thank you. Uh, Grant, thank you very much. Uh, a brief introduction about myself. I'm a management consultant turned into a climate artist. So I give you an artist perspective on what I've heard. One is art has a key role in leading education for human security and human security for all. Secondly, I like to go back to uh, Jerome Glenn's comment about artificial intelligence. And one of the most influential things that I have come across is this, Atlas of AI by Kate Crawford. I recommend it as reading at, or as reading on all at all universities when we get into the hype subject of artificial intelligence. Because as Kate explains, it's not magic, it's business, it's monopoly, it's about making money and it doesn't have any ethics and it needs them because AI is just technology programmed by people and people have biases and those biases get fed into what they program. So a little bit of recommended reading for students on AI. Thank you. Can I follow up on that AI comment? Fine. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'm on the, triple, the IEEE committee on artificial intelligence governance. And um, it is not looking at artificial general intelligence, it's looking at narrow intelligence we have now, which is still very important to do. And I can uh, tell you that I am so happy with that working group that the first session, I started crying at the beauty of what was going on. The best of human values, as best as we would probably all agree here, that committee has people from around the world, 
And the idea is like, what are those ethics? What are those values? And we've drawn from OECD and all kinds of different stuff around the world and saying, okay, this is what we, as best we, large we, can agree are. We, we can get into definitions of well-being, for God's sake. I mean, like, and so we give it definitions on all these things precisely enough that you can be audited. And, and so these standards will be coming out in a couple of months. The International Standards Organization has already come out with theirs, but it's a little more superficial. There's a little competition between IEEE and uh, ISO. But nevertheless, what, I'm, what I want to get at is that the issue of values and ethics on narrow AI is in play in the world. I am very happy with it. There is tons of stuff going on around the world. Uh, I am very pleased with it. And now that goes to the next step. What about the implementation part? Right now we have no treaty. You know, it's what is wild west. However, if nothing else happens, we at least will have the situation where people will say, are you, is your AI ISO compliant or is your AI IEEE compliant? So there is that sense of play in and one of the things that hit me in the middle of all this work is says, if AI, narrow AI, takes over the autonomic nervous system of civilization, sort of like running our transportation and plumbing and all that sort of stuff, the values that we're discussing will be more in play than if humans were making the decisions. Because as someone's pointing at, Jill, I was pointing out, a lot of the decisions are based only on money, not necessarily on human values, right? Whereas I'm telling you the AI that we're working on for real in the actual standards committees and defining are very much human values centered that is acceptable to the Chinese, to Europeans, to Latin Americans, to Africans and so forth being worked together. So I am very pleased with what's happening on narrow. Totally unpleased on what's happening on general. That's why I focused on those initial conditions for general. That to me is the big, Big, big problem coming up. Are there any other insights from anybody about what stood out for them over the last few days of this conference? Something, an insight maybe which hadn't occurred to you before of the interconnectedness of human security and education. Um, hi, I'm Ranjani, Associate Editor of uh, Cadmus Journal and Associate Fellow of the World Academy of Art and Science. I'd like to agree with uh, fellow panelists here, Dr. Glenn and uh, Dr. Wilmot, who touched upon this very important theme of values. And especially as Dr. Glenn mentioned, it's about the regulation of AI with values as the, the you know, the essential element uh, that is needed right now in this world. And it was such an honor and a privilege to know about the many things that are happening. It's just that we don't know about, we are not aware of the things that happen at you know, other levels. Uh, so the conference, which is being held in support of the HS4 campaign, I would say is already a great, it's a big success because it has made us realize that each of us is a crucial stakeholder. It's not about a top-down approach anymore. It's about, you know, what can I do to make a change, right? Even the youth for that matter, whatever they are doing, they are doing with so much conviction and responsibility that, uh, you know, we are realizing it's not just about governments taking up efforts to bring down change anymore. So, and the best time, one panelist said, the best time to instill social responsibility is early childhood education. So it's during this conference that I realized of the many things that we take for granted, education is one, because it's exactly this issue that, you know, the three-day conference has tried to address to help us become more aware and conscious of how to use the single most powerful instrument to address you know, human security, which is the foundational element of everything. And uh, it's no coincidence that one of the panelists mentioned SDG 17, which is all about partnerships. 
as the you know the most crucial of all because you know and you know bec because it's partnerships we've now identified they're all sdgs are all interrelated and now we must get together to you know make sure agenda 2030 takes place on time and was being this network of networks is trying to do exactly that by forging and leveraging connections for conscious social transformation so and as to what should be done i really liked your question i think the world needs more marketing of the good things that take place because a lot has been taking place but it's not coming out into the open because of the media what we hear about is only the bad stuff right why ai doesn't work what's wrong with it we don't hear about the good of it and i think we should start doing it market ourselves more so the world knows what we're doing thanks ranjani and piro you've had your hand up oh uh, thank grant but i'm after chris huh? is a uh, uh chris and uh, chris had a, had a say earlier i guess you have some more, more to say chris um well, I was going to uh, say one key thing that struck me from the panel that I shared with uh, Dr. Benno. Uh, he used the phrase of technology moving to we, not me. And I thought that was quite an interesting uh, way of encapsulating many of the things that uh, the panel talked about and the, 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 this group has talked about. Mm -hmm. It's it's the we, it's collaborative. Mm -hmm. I know there are things that I can do, but it's the we. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Piro? Thank you so much. I have to, to go very, very fast. Um, I'd like to share with you some, 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 ideas about that uh, in the last three years uh, uh, discourses on emergency and black swans uh, have pretty much dominated uh, many of our international conferences and meetings very often with the proposal on how to predict uh, and prevent emergencies or at least how to effectively control or and manage them Yet, what is missing is uh, the awareness that emergencies and black swans are intrinsic parts of the complexity we inhabit. Our job is uh, um, to learn how to cohabit with the black swans, how to cope with complexity uh, by learning how to expect the unexpected rather than fooling ourselves that we can predict the future or manage complexity. The very idea of um, uh, managing complexity is, uh, in my opinion, a contradiction in terms. We need to go beyond the black swans, accepting emergency as an, an integral part of emergence, which is uh, the spontaneous, uncontrollable, and unpredictable self-organization of life. Because complexity, as you know, as a feature of life uh, and living beings, requires an extremely wide range of abilities, skills, and first of all, epistemologies. I think that we are dealing also with particular challenge, challenge of rethinking think, and rethinking how we think. Above all, uh, we need a different approach. Okay, 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 I'll come. And in particular, I think that the future of education and the rethinking that must be undertaken to educate our students to be able to inhabit the future in all of its complexity has always been of the key points of my research. Unfortunately, as you know, we are still approaching complexity as though it's very just something very, very complicated something big, blurry and confusing, but what we will in time be able to fully comprehend, control and foresee with the aid of the highly advanced tools we are creating. In fact, uh, one of the most fatal errors we are making is to confuse complex 
and complicated systems that are manageable. In everyday language, the term complicated may be considered a synonym for the word complex. Uh, as you are no doubt aware, system thinking is an alternative way of considering life, an approach that focuses not on isolated objects or parts, but on the relationship between these parts. And uh, if you are dealing with a complicated system, which is an artificial, mechanical, and you can think on AI and the problem of simulation of humanity, main main system, we can break it down into separate parts and put them back together. And the total sum of the parts will be equal to the whole. We can manage and predict the evolution of these parts and system. But uh, as you know, biological, human and social system, in other words, living system, are completely different kettle of fish. First of all, it is impossible to break down these systems, which are dynamic nonlinear system in two parts. And even if we could, when we put them back together, we will find that the whole is greater, richer, and more varied than the total sum of the parts. These parts are interconnected, interrelated, interacted, and interdependent. What is more, they are capable of self-organization and they are characterized for emergent properties that are not observable. And on the contrary, as you know, we are continuing to be educated and trained to isolate, separate, identify a single object, what is deeply interdependent and interconnected. So, as I told you also in the um, precedent panel, transdisciplinary is a fundamental issue and no longer concern scientific researchers and scholars. It is about the life of our democracies and our ability to inhabit complex system. Uh, that, that systemic change, uh, we need awareness that uh, systemic change must begin uh, from grassroots communities and single individuals and groups. And by definition can never be a top-down imposition implicates a necessary rethinking of our educational institution, with, uh, which are still, as you know, on logic of separation and false dichotomies. So we are already, I'm going to hand to finish, we are already living in a hyper-technological civilization that is progressively augmenting its systems of automation and simulation, which are pushing aside human beings and their decisional territories and reducing the dimension of res responsibility. A cultural paradigm imposed towards reaching perfection, towards reviling the perfection of the machines. But it's precisely our heroes that denote, denote sorry, our being human and being free, which must include the freedom to make mistakes uh, or heaven just to think about uh, making them. Thank you. Thank you, Piero. One of the things that Ranjani mentioned earlier, which, which stood out for me, was the role of the media, and in particular, access to, to education. So the more globalized we've become over the last decade or two, the more fractured we've become too. Um, in certain parts of the world, certain countries, you have access to, um, to the ideas that have been um, shared over the last few days. Um, but it's a lot of places um, censor these things as well. And we are seeing a couple of technology companies ruling global thought in some ways, where you have a single stream of information. If you think of social media platforms, where a lot of young people get their news and their information and in their education in some parts of the world. So my question is, how do you break through that and create the rich diversity of human security and education globally um, when you're up against technology, AI, as has just been mentioned? How do we, how do we, it's, it's almost like getting the biodiversity back in the environment where uh, people have looked at, um, you know, food production in a very systematic um, way. The same has happened with, with education in some ways, in my view. 
it's been very narrowly presented by a few big technology companies. So how do we get that biodiversity, that, that rich diversity back into the education debate? Uh, Chris, I think you're talking, but I can't. Chris is before. I think you muted, Chris. Uh, I, think, uh, I think the answer to your question is in one sense very simple. If you want diversity, you can't control it. If you try to control something, you're going to narrow it down. So in a slightly contradictory way, diversity arises because different people in different places around the world come up with different ideas. Right. So you do that in education. Right. Thank you. Piro, you had another comment? Thanks, thanks. Uh, I think that um, uh, any global initiative uh, that uh, may be set up the, to coordinate uh, uh, movements and, uh, and ideas uh, from local individual groups and communities uh, should have uh, um, the following objective, not, not only this objective, both on a macro and micro level. Uh, first, uh, I think that we have to go um, overcome to overcome the age-old linear and cumulative, uh, sorry, models that are still profoundly affecting the structure and the very organization of fields of knowledge by setting up international projects uh, focusing on rethinking education, training, and research with educational institution. This project that is be designed to reformulate and redefine the complex architecture of the fields of knowledge and skills within educational institutions and training agencies with the objective of transforming the logic of separation and the monodisciplinary visions. Um, the second point, to try to define new international networks of research and work with the universities and scientific academies, association and institution, overcoming the traditional idea or view of learning as a process of accumulation of knowledge in view of increasingly complex and articulate learning processes that are with greater awareness, uh, with didactic methods using uh, error, doubt, and unpredictability, EDU, education. And uh, uh, first point to recuperate, try to recuperate the complex dimension of educational complexity through local and international project rewarding empathy, critical thinking, a systemic view of phenomena, and forward to try the best rather than ideal, critical okay. and elastic minds. Okay. And finally, to ensure that the international project and working groups. I think, uh, let's move on from Piro. You might come back again when his uh, connection stabilizes. Uh, Jalel's had his hand up for a while. Well, I, I think, you know, uh, there is a methodological issue here. Uh, I, I would like to start with an image. If you take a bird that you put uh, in, a, in a cage, okay, and you ask that bird to fly, no matter how good at flying that bird is, it's going to remain in that cage, okay? What do I mean by that? I think we should not think of the education system today with all this plethora of problems from and within the education system. Because the education system is that bird put on a big superstructure, which is the cage. And that cage has been defined and redefined and adjusted for at least 50 years. So that you know the cage magically disappears even though it is still there what do i mean by that i mean that the liberal hegemon has created a culture that made certain rules and ways of the sectors including education to make them common sense okay so, and, and one thing, which is 
financial gain, okay? And people, and uh, a moment ago, somebody was saying how beautiful to think of going from the me to the we. Let's not forget that this me issue has been hammered globally by this hegemon through individuals. When we go to school, we are taught and forced to be, you know, me, me, me through, uh, you know, uh, testing, through competition, through all kinds of uh, stratagems so that we create a culture that in a sense give us as an emerging uh, reality what we are fighting today without identifying you know that cage that superstructure so tweaking for instance and in was you know some people and that's very good have uh, you know uh, or chose or proposed to go from stem which is also a neoliberal stratagem to steam where we added the a to just you know the science engineering and what have you uh, curriculum that's very good but these are called by uh, Donella Meadows, I'm thinking the framework, tweaking the parameters. If you really want to change things, you have to restructure the system. And in our case, to restructure the system, we have to take that cage away. Okay? So staying in the cage will only allow you to move within that cage. And we are not happy with it. And the human security and even our existential threats that we are, you know, experiencing today are due in big part to that cage, and in particular to the education system within that cage. So I believe we have to really, you know, take uh, this meta uh, view of things and understand the problem in a systemic manner and identify the structures behind the ills that we are to alleviate by tweaking some parameters that will help, but will not help enough to really eliminate the problems we are facing and somehow liberate humanity so that it can solve its problems and save itself from its existential threats that it generated itself because it accepted to be confined to that cage. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we have about uh, five uh, minutes left of this session. And I wanted to quickly ask uh, each of you just to quickly give one insight into how you have found the last three days and what you think could be improved, whether it's the structure of the conference, the, the panelists, uh, suggestions for the next one. This is now the sixth international conference on future education. Obviously, World Academy would love this to become bigger and better each year. Um, could I quickly ask each of you just to give one quick thought on how how things might improve and anything that stood out for you that you think um, could be better next time? Um, and let's start with uh, Chris, who has his hand up. Uh, sorry about this. Uh, I looked down the list of speakers, uh, there's 116 or maybe 120. I tried to count how many identified as artists. I only came up with a handful. So my recommendation for a future edition is let's get the number of artists speaking mm -hmm. up to a number uh, and I choose 42. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Jalal, would you like to just give a comment on what you think would be improved in the future? Well, to tell you the truth, this is uh, my first uh, con you know, conference. Uh, of course, uh, the topic is uh, of uh, strategic importance and there is no doubt about that. Uh, the one thing, for instance, this uh, session to me uh, is, is, is a very, very, uh, you know, productive uh, exchange. The one thing that uh, I would like to see more of in this conference uh, uh, is maybe to have more 
uh, mingling between you know uh, uh, the guests and not sticking to, and and not really trying to put them in one and specific topic for instance the uh, the arts education uh, this an education that an education that's needed but and what i was saying early on that is more you know that belongs more to the tweaking kind of a posture uh, that one might take uh, to help uh, you know improve education but i believe we need to have session where we have people coming from very different and diverse uh, uh, domains so that they can mingle together and and somehow create the synergy uh, 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 that will allow them to really see the light somehow, you know, uh, because it will be like the diversity on the level of ideas, very much like biology. Ecosystems thrive because of the diversity, all right? So there is also an ecology of ideas. And I believe, I think we should encourage to some extent I'm not asking you know to change all the sessions to become uh, uh, such sessions. Absolutely no. But at least create a, a, a couple of them where cross pollinate uh, each other's ideas, backgrounds, and even jargon. You see, because uh, by confining ourselves to silos, we are also you know limiting the a possibility and solution space to apprehend these very complex problems that my friend Piero likes to call high complex. Okay, so uh, you can only deal with complexity with complexity, and complexity in this case is variety. Thank you. Great, thank and you. That's a cybernetics, and that's a cybernetics principle called, you know, the requisite variety principle. Great, thank you very much. Um I know, Janani, you had some thoughts earlier as well, um, having been very involved in the conference from the very beginning. Is there anything from the, the WAS side that you, you could uh, give us some insight on? I, I totally agree with what Chris said, actually, the role of the artist, the value of art. And, and one of the points that stood out for me in this conference is the role of the arts, literature, film, music. We also had presentations about the value of uh, tourism, culture. And so this value of the subjective and emotional aspects of reality when combined with the objective, scientific, analytic facts, it constitutes real knowledge. And that came out again and again, repeatedly in several sessions. And so I, I totally agree with Chris. We really need to bring in more artists and the point by Jalil also actually, where we need to you know, cross-pollinate. I think these are very valuable, which we will you know, take into account. So this was what I had to say. Okay. I think we're almost at the um, at the closing time now, and I know we're moving to the final session. So uh, I'll leave Janani just to wrap things up. Thank you very much for your input. Thank you, Grant. Thank you so much. And thanks for everybody here for all your interventions. And uh, we hope to continue this conversation and not just the conversation, but translate it into action on the ground. <laughs>